Hello and welcome to today's webinar. Today's enterprise content demands a modern approach. I'm Teresa Resick, Director of Webinars here at AIM, and AIM is your host and producer of today's event. With me today are Cheryl McKinnon of Forrester Research and Michael Fee of ASG Technologies. ASG Te Technologies is the underwriter of today's webinar, and we thank them for their support. And thank you for taking the time to join us today. Before we get started, I just want to offer a few pointers for viewing today's webinar. By joining the webinars live, you can customize your own viewing experience. So feel free to open, close, or resize the different windows that you have on your screen. Across the bottom of your screen is the list of all the widgets that we have available for you. We invite you to participate in the group chat and um, open this by clicking on the group chat widget icon that is in the bottom of your screen. And with this, you'll be able to chat with each other and also with AIM staff. So please be aware that everyone will be able to see everything posted in here, but I encourage you to open the group chat and join in the conversation with us. Do also ask questions of the speakers throughout the hour using the Q&A feature, and that's to the left side of your slide area. We will hold these until the end, where we should have about five or 10 minutes uh, to answer those questions. So you can also use this feature to ask for some technical assistance. You can download a PDF of the presentation at any time. Just look to the resources list that's to the right of the slide area. And there are also some other links in there to help you learn more about today's topic. At the end of the webinar, a brief survey will open in your browser, and would greatly appreciate it if you take a few moments to offer your feedback and suggest other topics for us to cover. You can also access the survey, again, in that list of widgets across the bottom of your screen. This webinar is being recorded, and it will be posted to AIM.org's Resources Webinars page in just a few days. So now I'm going to introduce our speakers that we have with us today. Cheryl McKinnon is Principal Analyst at Forrester, serving the needs of enterprise architecture professionals. She covers the trends, challenges, and recommended practices for managing enterprise content. Her focus is delivering research and advisory services into areas including ECM, content archiving, enterprise file sync and share, document-centric collaboration, lifecycle management, information governance, and e-discovery. And Michael Fee is Vice President of Strategic Technologies and Content Solutions at ASG Technologies. And Mike is a content management industry veteran with over 20 years of experience in business development, sales, and related activities. Mike joined ASG in 2007 through the ASG acquisition of Mobius Management Systems and has held various roles for the two companies. Prior to that, he had 15 years of operations and technology leadership experience in the banking and financial sec services sector. So right now, I'm going to turn things over to Cheryl McKinnon of Forrester to begin our presentation today. Cheryl? Great. Thank you very much, uh, Teresa, and to the uh, whole team at uh, ASG and AIM for inviting me to be a guest speaker today. Um, what I'm going to go over over the next approximately 30 to 40 minutes um, is just to talk a little bit about some of the high-level trends that Forrester's tracking in the broader content management market, and then actually move into some of the uh, custom research that we did in conjunction with our uh, Forrester consulting team and, and ASG, uh, taking a look at you know how organizations are looking for fresh, modern approaches to addressing their content-centric challenges uh, as we move into this very mixed world world of both on-premises, cloud, and any number of content management applications and silos. Then we'll wrap it up with some recommendations and a conclusion. And I, I will expect this to be a bit interactive, so I'll invite Mike to provide some commentary as we go through some of the data points. Just to kind of start at a very high level, for the last several years, Forrester Research has actually been talking about and researching what we see as kind of a 20-year business cycle out there in the broader business and technology market, what we've been calling the age of the customer. And what this simply means is that we are ever more dealing with empowered, educated, technology-savvy uh, consumers, citizens, whether they act on behalf of themselves as individuals or on behalf of the businesses that they work with. And it simply means that, as, as ever before, we need to look at how organizations can better streamline their content, their communication, the data that they use to make decisions to better serve these ever more empowered, knowledgeable uh, uh, customers. 
So we've been tracking what we call our five market imperatives. And for 2017, the things that we think are most critical to businesses as they look to the future and look to, for ways to better serve their customers and prospects is first off, you know, how can we look at driving revenue with a better customer experience? How can organizations differentiate themselves using digital? How can organizations build a customer insights-driven organization? So really understanding how to tap into the content and data that they hold to make better decisions. How do they excel at customer-focused marketing? And probably most relevant to the attendees here, how do we really maximize the business value of the technology decisions that we make? So these are the, the five high-level market trends that we really shape, we see shaping the business and technology climate over the next year or so. It's also interesting to see where organizations have their big picture corporate objectives. Forrester does a number of very large scale uh, surveys, global surveys, uh, year over year. And one of the, the biggest surveys that we do is what we call our priorities and journeys survey. And in this case, for 2016, we actually surveyed over 18,000 both business and technology decision makers to really understand what are those top level priorities facing their organizations. And number one at 74 percent, probably not surprising, is that the mission is to grow revenue. So continue to expand the footprint, gain market share, get the get revenue stream solidified, followed very closely, however, by the, the need to improve the experience of their customers and the need to improve the products and services that they take to market. So really interesting to see that the top three corporate priorities, if we look at this at kind of a, a large global scale, is all about quality of experience, of services, of goods, in order to drive better, deeper revenue streams. So this is really what's driving a lot of the broader technology decisions uh, that organizations are making today. Forrester's also been conducting research into how some of these more successful companies, those companies who've made that leap into a digital transformation mindset, who are able to serve their customers and their employees much more effectively with digital, how have they actually been able to do that? And so we've published what we call our customer obsessed operating model. So what are some of the, the characteristics of these kinds of modern cutting edge organizations? What are the levers that are available to pull to be able to uh, reorient the business? And the businesses that we see as emerging more successful in this world of digital are those that are customer led. So they're very in tune with what their customers and prospects need of the goods and services that they take to market. They're insights driven, meaning that they are able to tap into the data, the content, the communication effectively so they can use data to drive better decisions. They move quickly, so they're adapting more flexible, agile, not only technologies, but practices to deploy them more effectively, and they're connected, meaning that there's a uh, in information is easily uh, shared and uh, collaborated upon. So the organizations that are making this pivot to much more digital way of working are those that are able to leverage technology, the processes that technology supports. They're able to adopt the metrics that show them that they're working in the right direction, they're able to structure their organizations and teams in effective ways, and again, continue to modernize their approaches. So this operating model is what we see emerging with those most successful organizations. The other really interesting, and I've kind of called this in, um, in some of my research, kind of one of the quiet disruptors in the broader content management market is the recognition that enterprise boundaries are shifting. In fact, in many cases, they're dissolving. And what that simply means is that when we think about content, workflow, process, the way that we need to consume and engage with information, it means that people who reside outside of our business are often equal participants in those content creation, approval, or execution workflows. So for example, if I think of my extended enterprise, it means that I also want to engage with my customers, my partners, my suppliers, perhaps citizens if you're working in public sector. So the people that I share content with, I work with content on, that I look to for things like approvals and reviews, they often may not be uh, colleagues within the same enterprise boundaries. They may be part of that trusted ecosystem. And this has caused a bit of an inflection point in the broader content management market in terms of the technologies, the need to look at cloud services, as well as shifting some of the pricing and licensing models to accommodate those external participants. 
So let's talk for a moment about some of the key trends that we're tracking in the enterprise content management markets. But I'll wait just uh, for a, a quick comment from Mike there. Yeah, just, just as a follow-up to that, what we found most interesting is that the shift to extend the enterprise has grown exponentially as bandwidth combined with mobile devices increases that demand for both speed and ease of access. Great. Thank you. All right, some of the high-level trends that Forrester has been tracking uh, over the last year and what we kind of see the outlook for for 2017 into 2018. Uh, this is a healthy market, but we are seeing that there's some fresh thinking that's required. Um, what some of the data points that you're seeing over the next couple of slides come from my uh, annual, uh, what we call a panel survey. So people who read our reports on the enterprise content management market, who log inquiries with us, um, these are the people who have responded to this particular survey. And we do see that a very healthy uh, proportion of current program leaders do intend to expand existing deployments. So they're looking at new use cases, they're rolling out to more users, they're expanding the footprint of their current programs. It's really interesting that in 2000, uh, for 2017, the top drivers for investing in enterprise content management technologies are once again improved compliance. That's actually been kind of second or third place for the last number of years, but for this year it has gone back to the top of the list in terms of a key business requirement uh, that ECM is looking to serve. Uh, followed very closely by digitization of business process, and that's been, again, a consistent number one or number two uh, requirement as well. From a top challenge perspective, it's really interesting to see that um, the issues that challenge content management decision makers inside large enterprises is this continued sprawl. We still haven't kind of cracked the problem of um, ungoverned file sharers or perhaps abandoned SharePoint sites. So that challenge of all of this relatively unmanaged information sitting outside of content management systems, that does continue to be a top challenge for many enterprise decision makers. And what's also interesting is that we see that about half, 51% of current program leaders plan to create a new business case for their ECM program. So kind of taking the step back, rethinking what are the new measurements, the new success metrics, uh, the new use cases that are emerging for some of these technologies. And some of those newer outcomes that organizations are looking to achieve are improving customer experience, improving knowledge sharing internally, and again, improving compliance. So still some, some new work ahead of us there. We do recognize this is a market that's very much in transition. Uh, I think, uh, you know, a lot of larger organizations have had a, a dream, you know, a bigger picture strategy for a number of years of, you know, the one repository to rule them all. But that hasn't been a reality for many organizations, especially larger firms. We do see that multiple systems, often from multiple vendors, is a typical scenario. And we are also seeing that the increased adoption of cloud services for content management is also continuing to put some complexity into the mix. But we are seeing that organizations are, you know, thinking about modern, more flexible architectures, shifting away from some of the monolithic suites that came into the market a number of years ago, architected for on-premises, to more cohesive content platforms that are much more nimble and can be deployed in cloud services much more effectively. And, and Cheryl, we have found that there are a number of reasons for multiple ECMs, including decisions that have led to uh, platform or storage device-centric environments. As the organizations move to the cloud, they want to make certain that they remain flexible and are able to change platform, storage devices, or even host providers uh, based upon the changing market capabilities and cost. Mm -hmm. Great. So now what I want to do is just spend a few minutes talking about some of the uh, recently commissioned uh, research uh, that ASG engaged uh, my colleagues on the Forrester Consulting Team um, to conduct in the market. And so what I want to share with you is just some of the key findings. So first, just a quick overview of the, um, the demographics of the report. So we conducted this research at the beginning of 2017, uh, surveying over 220 both technical and operational decision makers. Um, they needed to be responsible in some way for their content management programs, uh, management or above, uh, focusing primarily on U.S. and European respondents and regulated industries including IT, financial services, retail, manufacturing, and they needed to be uh, working for a large enterprise, so at least 1,000 employees, but in fact 82% of the respondents worked for firms that were over 5,000 employees. 
And you know, we wanted to test out the hypothesis that you know content is really key to driving customer communication and is an underpinning requirement for essential business processes. But as the variety and sources of content continue to expand, or enterprises need to kind of evolve their approach to content management and start thinking more holistically, more cross-repository uh, tools and technologies. So, um, one of the first findings, probably not a surprise to many of the organizations, uh, you know, attending the webinar today, is that this whole growth of, you know, so-called unstructured data, you know, that we often define as content documents. Um, the, the growth is continuing to e expand. So this whole challenge is, is not disappearing anytime soon. In fact, um, we see that over 60% of the organizations that we surveyed had 100 terabytes of documents or more, with 25%, in fact, having uh, over a petabyte of um, information. Uh, and we do see that when we ask the question, you know, how has the volume of unstructured data stored by your firm changed over the last two, uh, two years, uh, we do see that organizations, you know, are in growth mode. So 42%, for example, think that their content load has increased 11 to 25%. In fact, a further 8% uh, has increased by over 25%. So that growth continues. We also see that um, one of the key uh, challenges here is around security, uh, requirement to meet uh, compliance obligations, and organizations are still struggling with flexibility. So one of the top challenge when we ask the question, what are the top content management challenges facing your organization, uh, you know, selecting up to the top five, um, number one was to provide secure content access to that extended enterprise. So again, key employees, but also those trusted external stakeholders who we rely on to help us do our job and to uh, execute on business processes. So um, that whole requirement to do this securely in an organized, auditable fashion uh, came up as a, a top requirement. Second was the need to meet regulatory and compliance obligations, particularly in uh, industries that have a heavy degree of legal or regulatory requirements uh, that persists as a top challenge for organizations. And then uh, coming into um, some of the additional challenges, just the lack of flexibility that uh, some of these uh, technology decision makers are, are seeing you know, some of the limitations with legacy storage systems. So the ability to move quickly to cloud, to mobile, can be hampered by uh, some of the legacy systems that organizations have invested in. And, and Tara, we find this to be particularly true for highly regulated industries. It's not surprising that trying to combine ease of access and security with the demand for high volume delivery presents a tremendous challenge. Example of this might be a financial services company who has to provide access to tax information. Their demand increases exponentially, particularly at end of quarter, end of year, and yet they're also have, trying to deliver uh, access to highly regulated content. Mm. Great, thanks. Another key finding is that, um, you know, we see that organizations really have a, a plethora of systems out there. So these disparate systems are holding, you know, uh, components of our enterprise content. Uh, we asked our survey respondents, you know, how many different systems is your organization using to manage content? And nearly a third use five or more systems to manage their content. Uh, so, you know, going back to some of the comments that, you know, pe actually parallel some of the research that Forrester has seen firsthand, we do see that this whole uh, mixed bag environment, this very heterogeneous environment uh, continues to persist. And, you know, we do see that many of these deployments are very tactical in nature, departmental, you know, perhaps for a specific application, uh, for contracts management for the legal team, um, research management for the R&D team, for example. And we also ask the question, so what types of applications are being used to manage your organization's content? And we saw that um, the, the largest volume um, is, in fact, enterprise applications. So some of these uh, line of business applications that we might use for things like HR management, CRM systems, um, uh, ERP systems, those are often, you know, repositories of documents, files, a lot of that supporting information that we need to run our core business activities. Followed closely with 52% uh, those using enterprise content management systems, 
but not surprisingly, we still have a, a substantial portion using uh, file shares. You know, over over 40% are still relying primarily on file shares for their uh, documents and um, other forms of unstructured data. We do see that cloud is certainly on the growth path with respect to content management and content collaboration services. So this has been a, a persistent trend for a number of years. Um, you know, we do think that the, the tipping point in terms of adoption of cloud services for content management is still a couple of years away, uh, but that, that, that shift is certainly beginning to happen now. We do expect that we will be living in more of this hybrid world for this for the foreseeable future. We certainly are in a transitional world where you know we have very large volumes of enterprise content residing on premises, but organizations are testing the waters, you know, new applications for new departments, new programs, new use cases often are uh, being initiated in um, uh, software as a service or some other cloud or hosted model. We do see also that many organizations are, are adopting kind of a middle ground between on-premises and cloud. So perhaps they're looking at private cloud um, uh, services to be able to host their enterprise content management applications or working with their vendors in terms of adopting some kind of hosted model so they can uh, get rid of the overhead of the hardware infrastructure, uh, but still have the benefit of a familiar product. So we do see that there's a lot of different models in the market. Um, when we asked our survey participants what approach your organization is taking, you will see that um, you know the dominant model still is um, you know mul multiple on-premises repository systems from multiple vendors. In fact, 25% responded that that was their current approach. But we do see also that this hybrid model is certainly uh, you know picking up steam in terms of how organizations are shifting their content management. Um, strategies going forward. So an additional 25% saying that they had multiple on-premises as well as cloud systems, again, from multiple vendors. Um, the, the adoption of cloud only right now is still in very early days. Uh, so only about 8% are really claiming to be cloud only for their content management uh, applications. So this is still you know, a, a pretty substantial growth path that we'll, we'll see. Um, we do see that um, when we talk to organizations that are adopting cloud services, we're really seeing much more of a pattern now that we are uh, organizations are extending or complementing their current on-premise system with, with cloud services. So we still see that there's a couple more years to go in terms of that tipping point where we're going to see more uh, cloud adoption compared to more on-premises adoption. So we are in this transitional era for the next couple of years. We asked the question, so what are your organization's plans to move its content management systems to cloud? And we see that 44% uh, uh, who are using cloud, in fact, are using it to complement existing systems. So it hasn't been a complete rip and replace. It's very much a complement, kind of an extend and surround strategy that we're seeing in the market. And, and Cheryl, we found that content services really complements the, the whole cloud services approach, particularly the hybrid environment. Uh, the practice of being able to functionally isolate the content services such that they can be performed in different locations, either on-prem or in the cloud, and on disparate uh, processing platforms certainly supports that goal to go to the hybrid environment. Uh, the end users are securely accessing content from on-prem, the cloud, or other environments without having to know where the content resides, using any device, and receiving any content type. Great. Thanks. So we've talked a little bit about some of the uh, key findings and data points. Um, we also wanted to understand, you know, what did some of these uh, decision makers really expect from a modern approach to content management? What were some of the key capabilities that they needed that perhaps some of their um, heritage investments are, were lacking? And you know, we we do see that we've seen in the broad uh, enterprise content management market very much a shift across many of the major vendors to move from these monolithic suites. Many of them were um, assembled through acquired technologies to much more cohesively designed um, content platforms. So more flexible, 
more ready to be able to be deployed in cloud, uh, adoption of things like modern APIs to make things like integration and interoperability that much more easy. And you know, that whole ease of integration you know, is, is something that we see more and more organizations really want to tap into. We recognize that content is a key part of many core business processes. It serves as that foundation for things like customer communication, serves as the record um, that tells us how we made decisions. And so the ability to take that content and expose it, integrate it, making it a uh, an equal player in many other core enterprise applications is really key here. From a user perspective, we do see that um, users really want to be able to focus on getting the right job done and you know, getting visibility into the tasks, the documents, the data, related metadata that they need that might be sitting in desperate systems is really key to getting their job done successfully. So that whole ability to broker into potentially multiple systems to get that single point of the truth or get the right information to make an appropriate decision, that's really what the users are trying to get out of it. And of course, as we move into this world of you know 24/7 work environments, we work in many global organizations. That whole on-demand access, getting the right information, engaging with the right kind of data anytime, anywhere, in any context, a range of devices, is obviously something that's key to success as well. Just some of the data points behind some of those uh, top. Um, uh, capabilities that organizations are looking at. Uh, we ask the question, so to what degree uh, would the following capabilities really improve your organization's ability to manage content? And the characteristics that came up as most important, first off, that single system view of content across multiple systems. So hiding the complexity of multiple systems, multiple applications, a mix of cloud and on-premises systems. If we can hide some of that complexity from the day-to-day -day information worker who's just trying to get their customer the right answer, then that's really what is going to set up organizations for success. Um, second and most desirable characteristic is, again, that ability for users to get to the right information from anywhere, from any device. So the ability to serve up you know, content through preferred line of business applications or through mobile frameworks, you know, recognizing that many organizations have a bring your own device policy. This is the kind of thing that we're seeing um, being really key to that next generation of, of um, enterprise content and accessing it appropriately. And then, the, you know, third and fourth there that you see on the chart, uh, the flexibility to store content in a range of environments, whether that's in public cloud services, hybrid, or even private or on-premises and the ability to manage content regardless of its size or origin. So it might be um, a rich media file, video file, but also could be a traditional scanned image or, or text file. So kind of breaking down some of those um, divisions and barriers is also key. And, and Cheryl, I would add to that that the number one issue we have seen is, is how do I move critical content services to the cloud to save costs now while simultaneously retaining central administrative control of secure access uh, to provide redundancy, retention, et cetera. Uh, we believe this is supported and made possible through a policy management infrastructure that allows us to centrally manage and administer uh, those rules, if you will, but be able to operate the system in multiple environments so that you truly have a, a hybrid cloud uh, art structure. All right, thank you. And you know, just some concluding uh, remarks. Um, uh, your, your last comment, Mike, I think was really interesting. This that that plays really well with uh, what Forrester has been talking about the last uh, few years in terms of our you know bigger picture vision for where this content uh, market is going. You know, whether we think about this evolution from you know more monolithic on-premises systems, you know, the classic enterprise content management suites that many of us have uh, worked with over the years. We, we're now in this transitional era where we're moving into much more um, you know, design and developer focused content platforms, understanding that what the end users really need, what the business really needs, are those meaningful granular content applications that help me just get my job done in kind of the, the right context. But to do that, it means that we need to be able to integrate, to interoperate, to pull information you know, at the right moment into the right kind of um, interface at the right time. Um, if we kind of project forward over the next couple of years, you know, if we look at you know 2020, 2021, what do we see this whole shift looking like? You know, we do see that we're shifting to this world of much more intelligent, transparent content services. So if we think about it, 
you know, location in terms of, you know, where's my file, where's my document, you know, what system is it in, where do I need to go find it? Those kinds of considerations will be increasingly pushed into the background from the perspective of the information worker. And, you know, by exposing information uh, much more contextually, understanding where am I working, what device am I on, what's the context of the case or the contract or other scenario I'm working in, then that information should be delivered much more proactively and accurately using cues like metadata, location information, uh, identity. And so that's really where we see this evolution into this world of much more transparent and intelligent content services over the, the next few years. If we take a look at, at some of the, you know, the, the key findings of the report and kind of summarize it, you know, if we were to you know, put together some recommendations and uh, things to consider as you look at your next few years of content management investments, um, what we recommend is that you really think about your requirements today, but don't neglect those requirements of tomorrow as well. Really kind of set yourself up for success in terms of what you need, but where you're also your, your organization is going. And this goes back to, you know, what are those top priorities that you know your corporation is focusing on for the next um, uh, number of years. So think about the whole flow of information, you know, that's content, but also the related metadata, the related uh, information that gives it that kind of context, you know, gives it some kind of uh, provenance in terms of where it came from, where it's going to go. Think about those key business processes, really kind of think horizontally, you know, from start to finish, including the content as it leaves your organization into the hands of your key stakeholders, like your suppliers, your law firms, your design agencies. How does it come into the organization from those same external parties? And really think about, uh, you know, that end-to-end -end process. The metadata, the automation capabilities, the analytics that we're seeing coming into this market will really help organizations extract the insights from all of these diverse content stores. So, you know, metadata is something that uh, I think is going to have a, a really, really interesting resurgence as we think about next generation content management strategies. We've been in a very folder-centric metaphor for a number of years, but metadata is that connective tissue that helps us integrate content with other data-oriented systems, other line of business applications, that, uh, that hook that connects our, our different systems and helps us provide that context. We do see that analytics really has been the um, uh, metadata, uh, sorry, analytics has really been one of the interesting disruptors coming into this market uh, so that we're able to not just find the content, but really understand how people are using it, who's reading it, how is it informing us, where are there uh, related materials that we can intelligently package up and surface up to the information workers. Uh, the second key consideration is just to understand for your organization, what is that role of the extended enterprise? How are, are these external trusted uh, parties part of your digital work stream? Um, are we collaborating on sensitive items such as with our bankers or attorneys on things like merger and acquisitions or divestiture deals? Is our contract management team going out to suppliers with sensitive uh, bid materials? So think about how we engage uh, with the outside world and think about the benefits of having the, the security capabilities, the access controls, rights management, and of course the, the collaborative capabilities and ability to approve or otherwise move ahead in a workflow. And think about, you know, for the third and final point, think about this this hybrid strategy. The path to cloud is, is front and center for many organizations, but it often will take time because we have, as noted in some of the survey data, very large volumes of on-premises content that needs to be addressed. But if we think about how we're moving to cloud, think about how quickly we should go, what are the benefits that we're going to accomplish, if we want to truly move into more of a digital transformation mode, engage with our customers, our partners more effectively online, then this is where cloud can help us speed things up. But we do need to balance that, of course, with the compliance and security obligations that many of us have. Uh, some jurisdictions, of course, have data protection laws and certainly the whole specter of the, some of the new European laws for, with G GDPR starting to hit the radar in terms of understanding where sensitive customer data might be residing and how do we know that we can manage it even if it sits in multiple locations. So understanding um, where things sit and how content is shifting or not shifting to cloud is going to be really key here. And with that, I'll turn it back to our hosts. 
Thank you. And actually, I'm going to turn it over to Mike Fee of ASG right now. Uh, Mike? Right. We've got a case study that we wanted to uh, to share with the, the audience today uh, that we think very closely aligns with uh, some of the things that, that Cheryl has been talking about today. Uh, this is a top property and casualty company in, in the United States. Uh, and as you can see from some of the statistics here, uh, 50,000 employees, 900 locations, and 40 billion records. So that's a huge volume of everything that they're delivering, including the, the people that would need to receive content as well as the people that the, the volumes of content that are being managed. Having numerous repositories that are tightly coupled to business applications made it very difficult for them to adapt to a, a changing infrastructure. And so they really saw the cloud as, as a way that they could integrate uh, into this process and begin to make that change while understanding that it was definitely going to be a hybrid cloud structure. Uh, they have a very large data center infrastructure, and it was going to be more, very difficult to remain nimble in what they saw as a fast-changing IT landscape. Additionally, uh, access to legacy systems would become more and more difficult, particularly as the uh, domain expertise began to fade away for those systems that, uh, that were aging, uh, and yet they were very t tightly coupled to the business requirements that some of the business units had, so they couldn't necessarily uh, eliminate those systems, uh, certainly not overnight. This meant moving to a cloud that quickly <clears throat> to quickly remain competitive uh, against what they saw as emerging markets uh, around them that, that could change the, their competition landscape. And then also to migrate uh, to the cloud for forecasted substantial cost savings, uh, something that everybody is interested in, but allowed them to uh, continue to maintain or even increase security capabilities and, and stability, which was a very important part of this, the, the solution. Uh, we was what they had to say. And we heard two uh, key, key elements or two major challenges. One was external and one was internal. The external challenge is that emerging markets and startups could possibly usurp their uh, business in the marketplace because they can go directly to the cloud uh, and are not tied with uh, a lot of the legacy and infrastructure uh, that, had, uh, that had remained in this company's uh, structure for a number of years. The second was interesting, and it was internal. Internal in the sense that they saw a changing makeup in the workforce dem demands uh, and that uh, they really wanted to provide new and innovative technologies to their workforce uh, that included uh, things that were cloud solution-based or uh, open systems. This customer found that they needed a solution that could direct documents, print streams, and reports from every content-producing system and content-consuming business in the enterprise. This is a very powerful statement when you think about the volumes that they're talking about, and you think you talk about the size of the company uh, that they have to deliver with. Uh, they also needed a solution that was flexible enough to add cloud services. In this case, uh, Amazon Web Services is their choice uh, for their cloud environment uh, and that they would be able to impact the business quickly. Uh, this required leveraging the old existing content repositories and business deliverables while moving uh, to the modern content services architecture, sometimes referred to as functional isolated architecture. This architecture perfectly suited uh, to this approach because it allowed the organization to manage the content services in a variety of locations and platforms and include the cloud while centrally administrating key elements uh, of security, retention, and other levels of access. The results have been significant. Uh, they expect the overall cost savings to be 30% or greater uh, when it's completely implemented. And uh, this is consistent with uh, what some of the cloud providers have been uh, uh, introducing to the uh, marketplace, as well as the ability to consolidate uh, content systems to eliminate superfluous and expensive platforms that uh, they are no longer really required, and to minimize the storage cost uh, while improving uh, the speed of implementation. Secondly, they were able to move off, or they're, they're in the process of moving off of the mainframe, which they think will give them greater control over archive and distribution, as well as uh, easy access and integration to the content in the enterprise. Um, and finally, uh, they expect zero impact on their business and their end user community. In fact, uh, from what we've seen so far, they're expecting faster and more efficient access and, and retrieval to their uh, mission critical content to support the current and the future business needs. So a nice case study and certainly something, Cheryl, that I think is uh, very consistent with the findings of your report. Um, Cheryl and, and uh, Teresa mentioned earlier that there is uh, a TAP study that uh, ASG uh, underwrote or that ASG sponsored, but that is a study that was performed by Forrester. The study is available uh, for download, and we welcome you to go and to download the TAP study. Uh, this study reinforces many of the points that uh, have been made by Cheryl and myself during the webinar today, 
And we found particularly interesting the fact that uh, 50% of the organization surveyed reported growth in content at a rate of greater than 11%. So half of the organizations you talked to saw annual growth of, of 11% at a time when uh, many expected the growth of content to potentially decline. It's actually increasing. Um, secondly, that uh, the importance of security, secure access, and the demand of regulatory compliance were, were highlights that came out of the study. And finally, that hybrid cloud technology is definitely being embraced in the content services marketplace. Yeah, when I look uh, through that study, Teresa, I hand it back I, to you. Yeah, it's, it's when I look through that study myself um, before the webinar, it's there was a lot of really great information in there. So, a um, couple ways that you can get your hands on that study right now. There is a link in the resources list to that, and also when you download a PDF of the slides, that's a, there's an active link in there as well. So uh, you can click on that um, any of the links in the resources list. This is going to open up in a new tab on your desktop right now, and after the webinar, you can complete the download and, and uh, uh, check out all of all of everything that we have uh, available to you over there right now. So just wanted to mention that. Um, certainly also ways to reach out here to Mike at ASG and some other resources they have on their website. And likewise, there's contact information for Cheryl. And so we have been listening to Cheryl McKinnon at Forrester, Mike Fee at, from ASG. And uh, I do want to get into, uh, we have a number of questions who, that have come in here. And I'm going to do my best to get to as many of these as we can with the time that we have left. And um, Mike, I'm, I'm going to ask this one of you first because you were just speaking of it. With the, the implementation in, the, in this uh, case study that you were mentioning, someone's asking how long did the implementation take? <laughs> well, it's, it's still going on <laughs> um, because there are, there are many moving parts to that process. Uh, I think I think the overall expectation is probably 12 to 18 months, um, but but really you'll you'll see changes going on that'll be ever changing because in a hybrid, hybrid cloud environment, um, you know the the industry is changing. So certainly uh, the uh, opportunity to use storage platforms and uh, open uh, applications uh, will continue to to change how this uh, customer approaches it. Uh, but it it is uh, still in the in that process. Okay. Um... Uh, someone had asked a question here, and let me um, start with Cheryl, and, and certainly both of you join in on any of the questions that I ask here. Uh, but let me start with Cheryl on this one. Um, make sure I'm pulling the right question. Yes, uh, someone, um, with moving the content services to the cloud, and with having whether it's a private cloud solution, public cloud solutions, will that require a new type of integration capabilities for the content services? Um, what are you seeing in that space? And, and Cheryl, just asking your, your thoughts on that one. Sure. So this whole, um, you know, this world of hybrid that we're living in, um, you know, is is uh, compelling organizations to really think about, you know, integration strategies. It's it's often just not feasible to think about migrating content every time you need to have something in a cloud service because you need to more easily share it with, you know, your partner, or your supplier, whatever channel. Um, so the integration capabilities, you know, really are from those, you know, on-premises applications and systems uh, to often those cloud-based applications. Um, so the, uh, the security requirements there, I think, are going to be very key. This is where a lot of organizations are revisiting kind of their, you know, document classification, and I mean that, you know, in a, in a security or confidentiality context as well. So, for example, are there certain types of documents, you know, that contain personally identifiable information, perhaps, you know, that should not be resident in a cloud service, um, but perhaps needs to be resident on premises, whereas the bulk of the information perhaps can be, you know, safely deployed in a, in a service that's using public cloud at the back end. So, you know, there, there's a lot of um, interesting moving parts there, but from an integration perspective, you know, thinking about, you know, sensitivity levels of content, you know, who's the audience that needs to engage with that content, finding that right balance is where a lot of organizations are investing right now. Thank you. Thank you. Um, when you were talking, you, you had just mentioned like the personally identifiable information, and you had also um, mentioned in your concluding comments about the GDPR. And I've been following this closely um, in the uh, for the European marketplace, and certainly it's it's finally becoming an important issue um, for us in North America. Um, 
And, and so someone is asking in here, how do you view the effects of the GDPR with local storage, nationalism, it's all of those issues when it comes to managing and sharing um, and using business content? Mm -hmm. Well, I think, you know, one of the key elements of, of that uh, incoming uh, data protection laws for that covers Europe, but also businesses that, you know, operate in Europe. So it's not just for European companies. I'm glad you mentioned that North American companies are kind of waking up to it because any North American organizations or global organization that does business with European citizens, um, you know, can, can be subject to this. And, you know, the, the whole kind of end to end, you know, baking in, you know, you know, privacy by design, you know, understanding, you know, where that information resides. So if you are, you know, um, requested to, you know, uh, you know, go and reveal what you have held on a particular individual, you need to know, you know, what are the content stores, the locations, the applications that host that data, uh, how is it being protected or preserved, and, you know, if there's a requirement to safely, securely delete it um, because it's been over-retained or because there's a right-to-be-forgotten request that's legitimate. I mean, this is this is kind of the fundamentals of some of the content management, lifecycle management, um, you know, requirements many of us have been dealing with for a number of years, but uh, now has a kind of a, a new kind of fresh set of pressures on organizations because it means we need to know where information is, we need to know what's being held in that information, and we need to understand what kind of life cycle implications it has for us. Um, with respect to things like uh, data sovereignty, you know, certainly this this may vary, you know, nation by nation. Um, but if there's particular, again, particular types of content because it contains personally identifiable information, employee or financial data that needs to be resident in a particular jurisdiction, this is again, you know, where we can look to things like you know, a lot of the more flexible content services, you know, using metadata to determine sensitivity levels, you know, uh, by marking it with geographic indicators, you know, we can, you know, use more kind of policy driven approaches to determining where things reside versus uh, having to worry about kind of the physical location um, in and of itself. Yeah, and Teresa, I, just to add to, yes. to what to what Cheryl just said, I think when she said talked about policy administration, eh? We've talked about that before, but I think that's critical uh, to that process, particularly when you talk about sovereign environments and, and, and data that content that has to reside or stay in certain uh, countries or sovereignties. Uh, with policy management, you can centrally manage those definitions. So you can centrally manage everything from retention rules, records management to redaction process, um, but maintain that, uh, that, that level of storage or that level of on-prem uh, for that sensitive information that has to be kept in the environment. And just because this is a like, like a personal thing that I, I am following GDPR so closely, um, for those of you who are not familiar with it, please make yourself familiar with it because um, it's the General Data Protection Regulation um, in the EU uh, for the um, a, and there is a deadline for that going into effect. And, and if I'm not mistaken, I want to say it's um, um, early 2018, so the clock is ticking on this. And uh, AIM has. Uh, written some papers and, and had some webinars on the topic and it's something that I'm still following very closely this year and this year so I do encourage you to learn and understand the impact of what this means for your business um, just my personal plug for that because it's it's such I find it to be such an important topic um, I want to ask another question here that's that's that has come in um, Cheryl early in your presentation you were I uh, had a a few slides where you were discussing unstructured data and what that means today. And someone's just asking, how do you, how are you defining that? That's a great question because I think as as every year that goes by, you know, that that line between structured and unstructured data gets blurrier and blurrier. So, you know, kind of the traditional definition of unstructured data is basically things that don't sit in rows and columns. So, you know, it's not databases sitting in a, um, you know, a, in a, in a particular line of business applications is underpinned by a traditional relational database, for example, or, you know, sitting in a series of rows and columns in Excel spreadsheet. That's really how we've been thinking about um, unstructured data is, you know, uh, relative, you know, more text heavy, more image heavy, 
um, not just, you know, the, the, the data coming out of a structured environment. But I think, you know, that definition is starting to fall short to some extent. And it, it's because that we are seeing, you know, the rise of things like um, analytics coming into the content management market. You know, we are seeing um, the ability for uh, tools to, you know, do more deeper recognition of, you know, the information locked up in those document formats, you know, whether they're PDFs or office documents and so on. There's a lot of metadata attached to documents now. So there's a lot more structure inside these so-called unstructured artifacts than I think we, you know, we really given them credit for. In fact, you know, there's even some technologies in the market now that can do things like visual um, uh, recognition so that, you know, I, I know it's a contract just because it's shaped like a contract, for example, even if that uh, keyword hasn't been extracted out or converted into text. So, um, you know, we, we tend to define it as really, you know, uh, as documents, files, the content sitting inside of it. But um, I, I think we are starting to see these lines blurring um, as we see analytics and a lot of these new generation technologies come into the market. We, we would agree, Cheryl, and in fact, we would also submit that uh, for years now there's been uh, attempts or there's been a demand for taking unstructured data and turning that into structured data, that is extracting information and performing analytics against it, whether it's using spreadsheets or databases, and, and that's growing. We see that data analytics growing particularly applied against uh, what were traditionally called content structures or unstructured information. Yeah, and I think that's really key because we're seeing, again, uh, thinking about some of the, the research at Forrester that some of my colleagues are doing into what we're calling these systems of insights, for example, and that's all about getting the right data regardless of the source, you know, into one place to start making better, faster decisions about how we run our business or how we serve our customers. And if that data is sitting locked up in a, a TIFF or an image, you know, it, it's relatively um, dumb data. So we need the, the analytics, the extraction tools to pull that out and bring it into a format that can contribute meaningful to some of these better, more insightful decisions that we make. Um, have a really good where and how to start type of question here. And someone's asking, should a study be done to determine internally what the company needs, or just jump in and figure it out as you go along? Um, some strategies or thoughts or guidance on how someone should be tackling these issues. Um, Mike, can I start with you? Sure. So I think the first step is understanding where your uh, content services or content repositories are within your organization. Uh, I think Cheryl's study, you know, is, is proof point that the typical organization out there has, Cheryl, what, anywhere from two to, to ten or more uh, ECMs within their environment. Uh, and some of them are legacy and some of them are active and uh, some of them are growing and some of them aren't. Uh, so I think that that, that coupled with what the business uh, driver is behind the, those, those content uh, stores or content management repositories is, is critically important um, before jumping into the idea of how are we going to tackle uh, either changing our content services layer or moving to a hybrid cloud environment. Uh, I think the second thing, at least our experience has been with, with a number of our customers, has been from a regulatory standpoint, making sure that what we're doing is going to be compliant. Uh, and in some cases, our customers think it actually, the, the hybrid cloud environment actually increases their um, uh, adherence to the regulatory uh, compliant environments just because they either are getting into safer storage or it's backed up or the redundancy or disaster recovery mechanisms are better in the cloud than what they have on-prem. Thank you. Thank you. Um, just wanted to get to a couple of other comments here um, because we're getting close to the end of our webinar hour. And um, just wanted to invite you to check out that you know, AIM offers a variety of in-depth training programs, um, online, in person, a lot of different ways that we can help you uh, figure out and tackle in, in a variety of different topic areas, whether we want to focus more on the, the record side, ECM in general. So go to aim.org slash training and uh, check out and, and just to get some more information about, about ways that we can help you with your learning here. And just want to remind you that um, the webinar has been recorded and uh, it will be available to you all in the, in the next day or two and we'll let you know when that will be ready. And we'll also have that posted to the uh, resources webinars page. Also to remind you to download the resources that are listed on that right side of the slide area and certainly get a copy of the full study 
uh, that we've been talking about today. And also when the webinar is over, a brief survey is going to open up on your desktop. And I do greatly value the feedback that you provided in the, the feedback uh, in that survey. So appreciate if you take some time to complete that. Very much want to thank the underwriter of our webinar today, ASG Technologies. Without the support from our solution providers, AIM wouldn't be able to bring you these free educational programs. So thank you, a ASG, for your sponsorship of our webinar. And so as we do bring our webinar to a close today, I do want to ask each of our speakers for their closing thought or a key takeaway. And I'm going to begin first with Mike Fee at ASG Technologies. Your closing thoughts today. Yes, thank you, Teresa. Um, I think a couple of thoughts that I have and certainly have learned from uh, the study that Cheryl has been through and what we've been able to uh, see from the TAP study. But hybrid cloud technology is here to stay, uh, and it's growing. Uh, the demand for it's growing. It's, it's a discussion we have with virtually every customer that we talk to, uh, and there's either interest in, in where they're going to go with it or they're already headed down that path. The second thing is that several of the questions and several of the commentary that uh, that Cheryl has made have evolved around how do we manage uh, in disparate environments uh, when we have a hybrid cloud environment. We think that policy management is really critical to that process because it gives that central command of the content services uh, that are going to be disparate uh, and that are going to um, need to be managed both for regulatory compliance and also for uh, retention. Uh, it makes sense that the solution be able to handle disparate document types. We talked a little bit about what is unstructured data, and I think Cheryl was, was spot on. And the fact that that's changing, that definition's changing, and as it changes, it means that uh, you know our, our content systems are going to be able to handle not just the ingestion, but also the delivery uh, to the end user and business community. Uh, and so, how do we do that? And make sure that they can they can manage the content that they're receiving. Uh, and, and finally, scalability matters. Uh, there are volumes out there. When we start talking about petabytes of information that is very large information, very large content stores that have to be managed, it's not just the volume of the content, though. It's also the volume of the access uh, because as ease grows, as devices uh, get more sophisticated, and as the business users uh, find better ways to use that content, the volume of access will, will definitely grow and uh, the systems have to be able to handle that. And then finally, security uh, and stability. Uh, security is on everybody forefront of everybody's mind today. Uh, how do I make sure that the content I have is secure both when it's at rest and also when I'm delivering it to my business and customer base? And then my sister is, is my system is stable. That is, I need to be able to count on it 24/7. I can't afford for my content systems to be down when they become a mission critical part of our business applications. Thank you, Mike. And Cheryl McKinnon of Forrester Research, your closing thoughts today. Sure, and I, I'll, I'll actually kind of pick up the one of the final questions we had there was, you know, where do we get started? Um, I, I think, you know, my my closing comment is, you know, think about how you can move quickly. Um, you know, think back to that uh, customer obsessed operating model that, uh, you know, we've been we've been um, promoting for the last little while because companies that are, you know, competitive in their own markets that are serving their own customers and employees are recognizing the value of being flexible and moving quickly. And what's, what's interesting is, though, even though organizations largely have made you know, large scale investments in often uh, older systems sitting on premises, including things like file shares, um, there's emerging technology that can help you put that content back to work very quickly. And so, you know, you don't have to invest in necessarily large scale migration efforts. You can start harvesting from some of those content silos. You don't need to necessarily bust them all down. Thank you, Cheryl. And thank you everyone for your time today. Uh, for AIM, this is Teresa Resick, and we will see you on our next webinar. Have a good afternoon.